be ready to go. Okay, yeah, I see the little button saying recording. Awesome. So welcome everybody who is joining us for Quarantine Kitchen. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So you see my face right now. I'm gonna share um, the presentation now with you guys. So give me a second. And in there, I will introduce myself again. Okay, getting loaded up here. Okay, so welcome to the tonight's presentation is called Quarantine Kitchen. Uh, a fun little name. Um, I know a lot of us are coming out of quarantine after the stay at home order, uh, but learning how to navigate the kitchen and your hunger cues. Um, this is an issue that I've heard a lot from different patients and clients over the past couple of months. So it's a topic that I definitely wanted to touch on and talk about with you guys here tonight. So just a little bit of introduction. My name is Lydia Nader. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist with Illinois Bone and Joint Institute. I am uh, specialized in sports nutrition, weight loss, gastrointestinal issues, so any GI disorders, um, bone health, and women's health. Uh, so those are the different areas that I have worked in over the past couple of years. I personally am a runner and an athlete, so a little fun facts about myself. Um, so understanding and navigating the kitchen is something that I, I deal with on an everyday basis. Um, and I definitely am gonna talk a little bit about my own experiences being you know, at the stay-at-home order and being around the kitchen all the time during this. So um, wanted to kind of share that as a personal antidote that I'm a runner and an athlete. And there's me at a farmer's market. Farmer's market's going to look very different this summer, um, I think. But, you know, hopefully we'll get into those uh, soon um, this summer. So what we're going to talk about tonight, um, specifically navigation within the kitchen during quarantine time, so during stay-at-home order. Um, we'll talk about hydration, tips to stay hydrated, um, how to avoid mindless snacking. This is a very common topic that I get oftentimes with my patients, especially staying at home all the time. Understanding your hunger cues because we're now at a time where we're a little more silent, we're able to listen to our bodies. So this could be a little bit of a blessing to be able to see how our hunger cues are, um, how our body's talking to us. So we'll dive a little little deeper into what hunger cues look like. And then some recipes that are easy to make using really kind of staple items that you can get um, at the grocery store. Okay, so symptoms of quarantine kitchen. These are a few of the symptoms. Um, so there's low energy. This is what I hear um, oftentimes of people just like staying at home for three months um, and staying in their homes. It's that low energy or low motivation, which if some of you are here who are joined us a few weeks ago, that's a topic I talked about, about low energy, low mo motivation. Um, so this is definitely something I see when it comes to staying at home. Uh, mindless eating. So that's something that people are starting to find themselves mindlessly eating. People are experiencing weight gain during the stay-at-home order. That's definitely a reality um, for a lot of individuals. Experiencing sluggishness, both physically and mentally. Um, maybe you're eating out a lot more than normal because um, you just don't want to be in the kitchen as much. Um, there's also some confusion. Some people experience some, experience some confusion when it comes to the kitchen. So struggling to really know how to navigate within the kitchen. Maybe it's a scary place for you. I know for a, a, for a while, for me, it was a scary place to walk into. Um, so we'll kind of address that and how to make it not as mystifying of a, of a room in your house. Um, so people avoiding that kitchen. Um, so making it more inviting and more enjoyable to go into and not a scary place. So how to handle quarantine kitchen. So those symptoms, how to handle all of that. Well, first and foremost, keep it simple. 
oftentimes people will think that they need to keep it super elaborate. They need to have these beautiful plates and beautiful meals. Um, if you're on social media, you can feel like maybe your meals are not right or healthy. And I put quotations around that um, because it doesn't look like these nice fancy things that you maybe you see on social media or online, that doesn't mean that it's not nutritious and fueling you. So keeping it simple can take kind of the scariness out of being in the kitchen and providing yourself the fuel that you need. Be purposeful when being in your kitchen. Um, and what I mean by that is make sure that when you walk into your kitchen, you know why you're walking in there. And then you might kitchen because I'm hungry but there's more to it usually are you hungry because we'll talk deeper about that about why you're hungry understanding those cues um, but being purposeful when you walk into the kitchen you're going in there because you're gonna go get water or you're walking into the kitchen because you're going in to get your snack you walk into the kitchen to get your lunch for the day whatever that is make sure that when you walk in there you're purposeful so that there's avoids the mindless grabbing for different foods that you could sometimes have in the kitchen Keep to a routine of eating. This is something I talked about in my presentation on motivation and getting more motivated. Um, keeping to a routine of eating helps your body and your mind become more accustomed to your eating schedule. So hunger cues become more routine as well as it can help your sleep as well. If your eating habits are all over the place, your sleep ten can tend to suffer. Um, and this is something I also see as a symptom of quarantine kitchen in a way of people lacking in sleep um, or having a struggle to get good quality sleep. So having a routine and eating not only helps you during the day to have more structure with that, but also helps you in the evening as well. Quote unquote, pack your snacks and lunch as if going to work. So some of you may now be working from home. Uh, maybe you're slowly going back into the into the workplace. Maybe some of you are staying at home until September. I know there's a lot of people like that. Um, whatever your situation is, if you're staying at home and working from home, packing your snacks and your lunches as if you were going to leave the home and go to work can make a huge difference to curb that mindless eating throughout the day. Um, this allows for you to have those snacks ready to go um, in the mid morning or that mid afternoon and making sure that those snacks are purposeful as well. And having your lunch ready to go can mean it's just right on the front of that shelf on your refrigerator so it's ready to go. Or it means that maybe most of the food is prepped up and ready to make up whatever you're planning to do for lunch as and then easy to kind of take out and have for lunch. But having it prepared, it's a form of meal planning. It can be simple meal planning. It doesn't have to be crazy meal planning. It can just be preparing it, setting it out on the counter in the morning, Boom, you've accomplished a meal plan for a uh, checklist for the day. So this is what like a bedtime routine, but just talking about getting into that routine can make such a big difference. And here's just a fun little photo of different ways you can meal prep um, and prepare your lunches even when you're just staying at home. It allows for you to still stay on task and still stay in that routine. So talking about how to curb that quarantine, how to solve quarantine kitchen, we're going to dive even deeper into some of the some of the symptoms that have come up for a lot of individuals when it comes to quarantine kitchen. And one of the big ones is hydration. And you may think the kitchen, hydration, what does that have to do with one another? Well, hydration can be a big factor because dehydration can lead to sluggishness and tiredness. So lack of motivation, don't feel like getting up and doing anything. Maybe you're feeling fatigued, staring at a screen all day. Um, and so dehydration can not only affect our everyday motivation, but it can also affect our motivation to eat the right foods when we step into the kitchen. So if we're already tired and sluggish, we probably are not going to be grabbing for the most fueling up type of snacks or the most fuel up types of meals that are going to be nutritious for our body rather than maybe slow us down or continue to slow, slow us down. 
So dehydration is important as well because if we're dehydrated, it can cause a difficulty in sleeping. Um, and as you see a theme here, a lot of what we eat and how we behave throughout the day impacts our evening and our sleep. And so the more we impact it in a negative sense, the more uh, the more struggle that tends people tend to have when it comes to sleeping. And then it's just a constant cycle of low energy and lack of motivation. So we want to do everything we can to help our day to help our night. Also, when we're dehydrated, if you are one of the people who've started to get more active during this quarantine time, um, then you maybe are experiencing a sore, your, a sore body with sore muscles. Um, that could be a cause of dehydration. You're not drinking enough water. You're not taking in enough fluids because maybe you had more of a fluid routine. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to put it like that, but a fluid intake routine when you are you know, at your job or when you're, you know, going, um, going out and doing your errands and you're on more of a routine. So when you don't have that, it's sometimes a little bit harder to get that hydration in and people tend to lack in that. We also find that thirst cues aren't always accurate. This is especially especially uh, applicable to women. Um, oftentimes I hear this like, I'm just not thirsty. Even when I say like, you should probably get a little bit more fluid in your day to help you lose weight, gain muscle, maintain weight, get more energy, all those things. Hydration is the number one first thing I talk to my patients and my clients about, no matter what their goals are. Um, and they oftentimes will say, I just don't don't feel thirsty and that's not uncommon but we have to make sure that you still are drinking water just because you're not thirsty doesn't mean your body doesn't need fluid our bodies are made up of 60 percent fluid more than half of us is fluid so we need to make sure that we can't constantly have enough hydration throughout our days so starting your day off with hydration can make a huge difference and there's even some studies to show that it can be a better it can be better for you for your energy levels than having caffeine in the morning. So those of you that grab your coffee in the morning also have a glass of water in the morning too and see how that maybe impacts your day. So we know dehydration not good. We don't want to have that. How do we combat that? Well, first you want to drink half of your body weight in fluid ounces. So this, whatever your body weight in pounds is, divide that, and that's how much fluid you should have throughout your day. And this should be a daily average that you should be having. Um, if you're more active, we know that you need to have a little bit more fluid. You can do this as well by eating foods that are high in water content, like fruits and vegetables. It doesn't always have to be chugging water. It can be um, you're fr eating high water content fruits and vegetables. It can be making smoothies. Um, it can be um, drinking a low calorie type of drink. Um, it doesn't always have to just be water. One of my personal favorite tips, um, because it works so well for myself and I've seen it be successful for a lot of other clients, is using reusable straws to increase your intake. Um, this is something I found that has been really helpful. I have a large quart mason jar in front of me and I have a straw, reusable straw that I always put in there and I can drink almost um, 24 fluid ounces in one hour without even thinking because it's just so easy to increase your intake of fluid when you include a straw and using reusable is obviously a lot better for the environment as well. If you are in the home and you're struggling to constantly drink water, one of the things that's really helped a lot of my patients and my clients has been having a water bottle in the in the rooms that are most common for you or the rooms that you frequent the most. So having enough water um, can really impact how you move about your day. So if you move about your house um, or your apartment um, a lot, having the water wherever you frequent, so it's visually in front of you, we are more likely to drink water when we see it. You can flavor your water with low sugar options like using lemons, limes, or cucumbers, or even using electrolyte or sweeteners, like low calorie sweeteners, um, like Noon Hydration, which is a little tablet that 
great for travel, throw it into water, and it sweetens um, without being high in sugar. There's a lot of other brands out there. That's just an example of one you can do in case your reason for not drinking enough water is the flavor. Sometimes people just don't like the flavor. And for you active individuals out there, if you are sweating or exercising, drink more water. It should have an exclamation mark after that. Um, if you are exercising and you sweat a lot, you need more than half your body weight in fluid ounces. It's weight loss, you need more than half your body weight in fluid ounces. If you're sweating and exercising, drink more water. How do you achieve this? Have a water bottle while you're working out and have a goal to finish that entire water bottle before the end of that workout. That will be in addition to what are you already need to have, which is half your body weight in fluid ounces. So moving on from hydration to mindless snacking, what is this term? And maybe you're like, that's me, you're raising your hand, you're like, I mindlessly snack. Uh, mindless snacking is super common right now because it is so easy to walk into our kitchens without any purpose and just grab for whatever is in front of our faces, whatever we're craving, we give into those cravings because we don't oftentimes have a lot of accountability because we're in the home. So there's that more time in the kitchen that's not purposeful. Boredom is very much a real thing right now. Um, I hear about boredom snacking a lot, and that's something people deal with where they're struggling with. I'm just bored, so I wander, and I'll be bored and just start eating snacks. That's a, a very, very common thing. Comfort foods. This is a highly stressful time. There's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of anxiety that's, uh, that people are dealing with. And so people turn to food for comfort. And so a lot of comfort foods are, foods are a lot easier to grab for these days because we want that comfort and we have it accessible to us 24 seven comparative to maybe when we were going to work or we were going someplace outside of the home. Now, how do we avoid that mindless snacking? <laughs> now you're all like leaning in. You're like, okay, I want to know how to avoid this because this is me. You're like, this identified me. Ask yourself, why are you eating this? Why am I eating this? Have that internal dialogue. This might seem silly, but it's so simple and so easy to address the mindless eating and mindless, mindless snacking. So ask yourself. Why am I eating this? Next time you go into your kitchen and you start grabbing for something. Being purposeful about your snacks. So make sure that your snacks are fueling you properly. And what I mean by fueling you properly is know what your goals are. Like I said, my specialty in nutrition has a lot of different areas from sports nutrition and professional athletes to women's health and gaining a period back. You know, whatever the spectrum looks like or GI issues, dealing with, um, you know, uh, bloating and gas, any anywhere in that spectrum, you know, being purposeful and understanding your goals really helps with being purposeful and choosing the right kinds of snacks for you because the right kinds of snacks for you might not be the person next to you, might not be the same person in your home. So making sure you're purposeful about your snacks that you need. For example, if your goal is weight loss, your snacks need to have protein. If you need to make sure you pair your protein, this is a term I love to use all the time with my clients and my patients, because pairing your protein with each and every snack ensures that you increase your protein intake, which can help with weight loss. It can help heal the body under a lot of stress. I mean, that's like everybody probably here dealing with a lot of stress. And so pairing your protein allows for you to be purposeful about your snacks and why you're choosing those snacks pre-portion out your snacks. This is a great tip for those of you that enjoy nuts and seeds or trail mix, uh, like myself, um, pre-portion them out. There's some weeks where I don't meal plan or meal prep at all in terms of the traditional sense of meal planning or meal prepping. All I do is portion out my nuts and my seeds for the week for my snacks. 
And I've, I've accomplished meal prep at that point. I've meal planned for the week because now I'm prepared with purposeful snacks for each and every day. And it takes five minutes, five minutes out of my day to prepare my snacks and pre-portion them out. You can do the same thing with any, like if you have pretzels and peanut butter, if you have hummus and veggies, whatever your pair your protein combo is, you should pre-portion out your snacks. So start getting in tune with your hunger cues is also a way to avoid mindless snacking. And the first step is that asking yourself, why am I eating this? And we'll dive deeper now into hunger cues and understanding them. Because hunger cues are just your body is talking to you. But oftentimes we don't have a translation for what it's saying. That's where dietitians come in. We can help you interpret what your body is telling you. If you're having lots of, you say, I have a sweet tooth. Well, maybe your sweet tooth actually is, contribute, is actually being contributed because you're not including enough carbohydrates in your day. You know, maybe your hunger cue is your body telling you you need something, you're lacking something. So there's so many different languages our body talks to us in, and we're going to talk a little bit about how to Peel apart those layers to really interpret what your body's telling you. So first is kind of identifying, is your hunger due to emotions? This is, can be very common right now um, when we're talking about, you know, high emotions, high anxiety, stress. You know, is your hunger being driven by those emotions? Um, asking yourself that. Is your hunger due to anxiety? Is it quote unquote time for a meal? These are questions that go deeper than why am I eating this? This goes real deep into this because if you're hunger due to emotions, you're probably not hungry. If you're hungry or hunger is due to anxiety, you're probably not actually hungry. If you might be actually hungry, this is a question that if you ask yourself this, then your hunger is being motivated by your body saying, I need energy. If you're tired, it needs energy, that's the sign. So you wanna make sure that you're fueling up to make sure that you avoid those tiredness or sluggish moments. Are you thirsty or dehydrated? That's not necessarily that you need food because you can feel hungry when you're dehydrated. It just means you need to drink some more water. Simple, simple thing that you can do. So understand your, understanding your hunger helps guide your food choices. If you can ask yourself those questions and navigate what your body is telling you, then you're able to make more purposeful choices with your food. Plain and simple. I guarantee it might seem like it's going to take a lot of time to ask yourself these questions, but it doesn't take a lot of time and it can make a huge difference in your day-to-day -day fueling practices. We're gonna dive deeper even more so. So we talked about hunger cues, now into mindful eating. Mindful eating allows you to be aware and in the moment. This is something that oftentimes we are not in the moment. Um, one thing that personally I've been able to do in this quarantine and self, self um, stay at home uh, order has been able to be more present be more aware and be more in the moment. Um, while I'm eating, while I'm reading, while I'm doing whatever task I'm doing, I'm more aware and more in the moment. So it's allowed me to become more mindful in my own eating practices during this time. So I've, I've been able to, to, to strengthen my mindfulness. In today's society, we're often disconnected from our food, from our meal times. There's oftentimes so many distractions all day long, including during the times that we're eating food. That's what can lead to mindlessness in terms of eating. So we know there's distractions, we know these things are all going on. How can we become more mindful? First, reflect on your feelings. So asking yourself is, Am I hungry because of emotions or anxiety? Reflect on how you're feeling when you sit down to a meal. Are you anxious? Are you stressed out? Whatever it might be, 
just reflect on it. Maybe you don't even need to respond to how you're feeling. Just being aware and in the moment can make a big difference. Number two, sit down for meals. Avoid trying to be on the go with meals. Um, and right now, even with quarantine kitchen, some people are still on the go a lot. Um, avoid trying to eat on the go as much as possible. I know we lead busy lives, but this is a time that we've been able to slow down. And so this is a time to be able to start sitting down for meals. Serve out portions. So make sure that you are not eating out of a large bag of popcorn. Popcorn's not inherently bad for you, but make sure that you're not sitting there on the couch eating from a big bag of popcorn. Portion it out in the kitchen, leave the bag in the kitchen, maybe even close it up so that you don't have the temptation to go back to it, and then walk that bowl of pre-portioned out popcorn to the couch, and then you can eat at that. So things like that where you pre-portion it out and leave the other part away from you in the in the kitchen because the kitchen is the place where you're able to put the meals together or the snacks together and then you can go someplace and eat it outside of the kitchen. Have a smaller bowl or a plate. This can really help with the mental perception of the amount of quantity that you're consuming in terms of food. So make sure that your plate or your bowl is a lot smaller um, to allow for avoid the feeling that you're not eating a lot of food. My favorite, resign from the clean plate club. How many of you out there had the had a parent or maybe you did this yourself where you said you have to clean your plate before you get up from the table? I know I had that. My mom was very much adamant about that. And I love her and I and I don't hold this against her at all. But that practice uh, kind of enforced into me that I needed to finish everything, even if I wasn't hungry, even if I did, wasn't able to eat it all. Um, and that's not the case. It's okay to leave some food on your plate. Don't feel guilty about it. Don't feel bad about it. If you are a fool, you don't need to feel overly full. That's not a goal that you should have. You can leave food on your plate. Put it in for leftovers. Or you can even, it's okay to throw food away. Way. I know it's hard to say that. It's also hard to do. It's very hard to do. Uh, growing up in a family where we never threw anything out, we always ate it. I know that's very difficult, but resigning from that clean plate club can help free us both mentally and physically. And try eating meals in silence. Um, this can be without the TV on. You know, I'm not saying that you need to sit down with your family and not talk while eating, but having a meal or two a week where whether lunch or dinner where you're silent and you're paying attention to your chewing to your mood to you how you're feeling all those things allows for you to become more mindful in terms of your eating practices both with meals and with snacks and the more mindful we become the less of that mindless eating that we can tend to do so now we're gonna dive into some of the common foods in the kitchen. So these are foods that I have found that are fairly shelf stable. They've been easy to find in the grocery stores. I know a lot of people at the beginning of this um, stay at home maybe struggled to find certain foods in the grocery store, such as chicken. I know those was, those was going pretty quickly for a lot of individuals. So a lot of these first couple of um, ideas are around that where there were certain foods that we couldn't see as much. Luckily our food supply, um, the food that was still there, but the supply and delivery um, have caught up to the demand. Um, so a lot of these foods are still pretty staple in the, in the kitchen, um, but they allow for you to have a full balanced plate. So you have your potatoes, your beans, your fruits like apples, banana or oranges, fairly staple fruits that you can have, your rice, so using like wild rice or brown rice, um, eggs, always a great option for both meals and snacks, veggies such as pre-cut ones help avoiding the kind of, oh, I don't want to cut up any veggies, um, and so a lot of times people will buy veggies, they don't cut them up because they don't want to, it's boring or they're lazy about it, which I get, I've 
been there myself. Um, so buying pre-cut veggies can really make a difference. So things like broccoli or carrots or cauliflower or zucchini. Um, I know a lot of people do zucchini noodles these days. Things like that can really make a difference. Um, using nut butter. Nut butter can be a great way to get some protein in really easily. Um, So these common foods and recipes, um, I, in the kitchen, like to keep things simple. I am very much a keep it simple person. I do not like complexity at all. Um, and I really encourage the simplicity with my clients and my patients. Um, so the first picture you see here is probably one of my favorite recipes that it literally is three ingredients, sometimes add a fourth. It is salmon, bell pepper, and pineapple. And the fourth ingredient I sometimes add is quinoa to add a little bit of grain to it. Super simple, put it all on one baking sheet, throw it in the oven, and it's good to go after 30 minutes. It's such an easy thing to make that even when I'm super tired after a long day, this is a great kind of recipe to throw in. Another one pan meal, which are some of my favorites, using chicken thighs with some green beans and some sweet potatoes. Oftentimes people stay away from potatoes and sweet potatoes because they're like, they're too starchy. They're gonna you know, make me gain weight. Um, oftentimes that's not the case. It's oftentimes the amount of other calories and other foods you're consuming more of, more so than just the potatoes. So including potatoes can actually make you feel a lot fuller and allow for you to have, like you see here, some protein and some veggie, some green veggie, as well as having that sweet potato. So it's a well-balanced type of meal to keep you full for longer. Another great recipe that I've liked to be, that I've been doing with really staple items has been this um, quinoa black bean um, casserole that I've been making. So it's got avocado, your sweet potatoes, black beans, quinoa, um, some tomatoes in there, and bell peppers. There's lots of different ingredients, but super simple to make as once again, it's all on a pan and you throw it in the oven. And this is just one another recipe that has some common foods that are easy to find and shelf stable for you. I'm using quinoa, black beans, some canned corn or frozen corn, um, and making yourself a meatless uh, Monday uh, taco with some quinoa and some beans gives you a good amount of protein and it's gonna be a really filling type of meal. So these recipes are ones that I have included in a what I called a social distancing cookbook. Um, and it's one that I'll share with you guys um, for all of you that registered. I'll be emailing that out to you after the presentation today with some different recipes that you can try with some of those common foods that we talked about. So I wanted to end our presentation today to talk about really our ortho health program. And if you're not familiar with this program, it's an exclusively IBJI program that offers a collaborative approach to improve your health and wellness. So we combine the expertise of health coaches, dietitians like myself, and physical therapists to help you improve your energy levels, relieve pain and inflammation, and improve your daily performance. Um, whatever your goals are, whether it's weight loss, whether it's decreasing inflammation, decreasing that pain, relieving that pain, gaining muscle, improving performance, whatever it looks like, the Ortho Health Program is here to help you with that. So if you're interested in signing up for this program, feel free to reach out to our intake coordinator, um, Jake. Uh, I left the email and number here below. Um, and you can reach out to him and get scheduled. And we can start working together for you to start achieving your goals of improving, improving energy, relieving that pain, and improving your just overall performance in your everyday life. So thank you guys so much for joining. I'm going to switch over here from the presentation and come on over here. Seems like we have a little bit of, uh, yes, recipes. We will be sending out the recipes.
um, to you guys afterwards. Do not worry. So those of you that registered with your emails, you can check it after this, and I'll be sending that over to you guys. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Um, Lydia, I had I had a question for you. Um, I actually don't live in Illinois. Um, mm -hmm. I follow you guys on Instagram. I'm not sure how that happened, but I, <laughs> I'm a hip patient and in California. <laughs> um, I'm wondering how you can really tell if um, if the fatigue is related to nutrition. Um, I'm actually about 13 weeks post-op from a hip um, hip arthroscopy mm -hmm. versus, um, nutrition. Um, I, and then also, um, are you able to provide any kind of telehealth services outside of Illinois? Yeah. So your first question was asking about like hunger cues. Um, if it's about like tiredness, is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, like I'm not, I'm not, I'm hungry. I haven't gained or lost any weight. I've been pretty stable. Um, okay. I'm just wondering if my fatigue, how my fatigue is, is it related to nutrition? Am I getting enough um, versus it's just regular post-op fatigue? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, with post-op, in terms of nutrition, just speaking on the nutrition side of things, um, oftentimes there can be fatigue that is nutritional because going through surgery is a stressful time and it can cause inflammation. Um, and so oftentimes as our bodies are trying to heal themselves, that tiredness and fatigue is a sign that potentially you need to, you know, make sure you're getting the right kinds of nutrients, specifically protein, especially post-op protein is probably the, one of the most important nutrients to incorporate in your everyday um, intake. Um, which can help with kind of the tiredness feeling. Oftentimes I've seen, especially with females, as they increase their protein needs uh, post-op, they not only heal up faster post-op, but they also are able to, um, they're also able to increase their energy levels as well. So they're not as tired. Because I see this very often in females where they are not intaking enough protein um, to really meet the needs of everyday life. And then for you, you have that added need because you're post-op. So how many grams of protein typically would you recommend? Before um, my surgery, I had my personal trainer telling me, 100 grams was what he thought I needed, which sounds like an awful lot. So your trainer might not be too far off. Um, typically okay. what I recommend um, for for women, especially post-op, is, is 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. And I just use kilograms because that's how I was I was taught in the kilogram system. So if you wanted to figure that out, it would take your body weight in pounds and divide by 2.2, and that would give you your kilogram of body weight. So most women that I see are typically, um, you know, depending obviously on your weight, but are typically anywhere from 70 upwards of 110 grams per day on average. Okay. I was trying to calculate that real quick. <laughs> yeah. um, this is Kurt. I'm one of our physical therapists as well. Um, obviously, the other things that that in addition to nutrition, there, you know, what your experience is 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 not uncommon. Um, and I do have people that even though you know they track that and they get on track with their nutrition, um, and they still have a little fatigue, you know. And I think that's when you start to think about how are you ramping up your activities, what's your sleep cycle like. Um, and if any people said any, any issues with pain medication, that can not only affect your um, diet, um, but it also can interfere with sleep. Um, and the surgery alone in itself can do those things as well. So just trying to be consistent mm -hmm. across the board with all those factors is really important. But um, if you can make check this one off the list and make sure you're doing the right things with nutrition, then you can start looking at those other things and know that that will pass. People will get the energy back and some people will struggle with that for a little longer period. So just do all the right things and you can short circuit that. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I pain meds have been off the yeah. off of my schedule for like 
10 or 11 weeks. So yeah. I, that's I not an issue. Weeks, that wasn't the answer, but early on it often is. Yeah, I <laughs> for two days after. <laughs> Absolutely. And to answer your second question, um, Maria, the um, we do offer telehealth, um, so virtual consultations for nutrition. Okay, but could could you because I live in California, could you still do that, or are you like limited by your state? So you wouldn't be able to use insurance, but we right. would be able to do pay out of pocket. Yes. Okay. And how, I'm sorry, one more question. <laughs> um, I was gonna say, I can message you um, okay. separately after this. That would be um, great. Details. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys so much for joining for this presentation. Um, I know Kurt and myself will be presenting again in two weeks, so look out for that in Eventbrite um, uh, calendar and go ahead and register for that one um, when we post that up on our social media um, and join us for another presentation about wellness and getting you back into the routine of life. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Good night. Good night.